Would you turn with me to Luke chapter 20? Luke chapter 20. We'll begin in verse 19. The scribes and the chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour, and they feared the people, for they understood that he spoke this parable against them. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some statement so that they could deliver him to the rule and the authority of the governor. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he detected their trickery and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were unable to catch him in a saying in the presence of the people. And being amazed at his answer, they became silent. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the matchless wisdom of our Lord. I thank you, Lord, that he lives today and his wisdom is still matchless. There, there is none to compare with. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the wonderful expectation we have when we will be rendering unto the Son the things that are the Son's. We look forward to the day when you are going to be reigning and ruling on the earth as the Old Testament and New Testament continually promises. That will be earth's golden age, and, and we say with the, the believers of all ages, even so, Lord, come quickly. But, Lord, until then, we are in a difficult world. We are in a place where the ones who are in authority are not always um, governing themselves as though they were under the authority of Christ. And, and Lord, sometimes we're left in a muddle. And so, Lord, help us to uh, figure out how we should navigate all of this and do so to the glory of God. And, Lord, I would pray that you would enable to see things in the Word of God that perhaps we haven't seen before. For your glory and our joy, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you say, man, this, was, uh, this is where we were last week. Like, we used the same verses. And uh, what in the world? Well, the first one, we kind of split this into two. And I, I would feel more comfortable, i got to tell you, if we had split it into eight. Uh, and done the last seven on this last little bit. First one we talked about, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and we did that in one, and we didn't do it justice by any means. I would like to have spent at least half a dozen on and render to God the things that are God's. But um, there's a, there's a, um, a thing that kind of hits you as a preacher. You, you think, well, how can I even broach that subject? How can we even kind of dive into it? And because the, the, the subject is daunting and you have the fear, but I might not say everything that needs to be said, you have a, an inclination or a temptation to say nothing. But I'm going to do something different. I'm going to say something rather than nothing. And, and I'm going to be trying to affirm some things that are in the Word of God that I hope are helpful to you instructive in your thinking. If you want to pursue <clears throat> this area of a believer's relationship to Caesar, there's a couple resources I would direct you to. One is a uh, book by Jesse Johnson, who is a pastor at Washington, D.C. He's actually um, Vice President Pence's pastor. Uh, he's written a very good book on this. Uh, if going down the scale quite a bit further, if you are interested in this, I did a series through this particular issue 
as I covered um, Romans 13 and Romans 14 <coughs> in our Romans study in the Murnam. And so you'll find them under uh, KRUX um, channel under Mixler. And so I'd invite you to have a listen to them. And in that, I didn't cover everything that needs to be said. I won't do it. I won't cover everything that needs to be said today, but we'll say some things. Okay? Well, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. Render to God the things that are God's. Last week, we looked at the first part of this wonderfully comprehensive statement by Jesus in verse 25. And he says, to give an expanded treatment, accordingly, appropriately, render or pay back what you owe to Caesar the things that are Caesar. <coughs> and we said there were a number of things that these people who were languishing under Roman rule had actually received that were beneficial that God says now you owe the Roman government for, you should be paying for. Um, they, they owed some things. Even immoral, idolatrous, oppressing, authoritative governments can end up doing some good or providing something of some value. And accordingly, in the view of God, this incurs a debt on the part of the citizens of even ungodly, ugly governments. Or put better, according to Romans 13, God will be accomplishing some good some sovereignly purposed outcomes in the lives of his subjects as they are at the same time subjects of a pagan government and evil men. And God can pull that off. So he says, accordingly, pay back your debt to Caesar. It means at a minimum, pay what the government says you owe us taxes. It also should be that we are distinguished as believers of people who are speaking in um, polite, moderated tones about believers that we even question their governance because they have reprobate minds. We should be people who nevertheless are um, charitable in speaking about our leaders. Honor the king. Honor the king. We saw that. But pay what the government says you owe as taxes. Their foolishness or sinfulness is not an alibi for you to participating in the latest tax revolt. All right. But, the statement goes on, but render to God the things that are God's. And we're going to kind of parcel that out a little bit today. <clears throat> what do we make of the second statement? What if the obedience to the government puts you at odds with fully obeying Christ? How do we render to God the things that are God's then? What if some governing body has sought to enforce a rule that interferes, interferes with another governing body or your walk with the Lord? What then? This is a reality we can expect to encounter more frequently in the coming days if the Lord tarries. We are in our day, we will see, as other ages before, the rise of tyrants. And so let's first of all consider what is a tyrant. Tyrant is someone who has claimed for himself authority that God, or someone appropriately placed in power under God, has not granted that authority to. They're grabbing power that is not theirs. They've claimed for themselves authority that no one under God has granted or bestowed upon them. Um, and that can be even something as small as um, I was walking around in the co-op and I had, was putting a certain thing in my cart and some apparently, I, I will assume, 
good-natured old fellow came up and said, you shouldn't be buying those kind of things. They are, and he had a reason why those peaches were not the thing. And uh, I think, I, he was just so close to saying, well, your badge, sir, where's, where's your badge? Who, who gave you the authority to stop shopper? Anyway, but there are people who have a tendency toward being tyrants all over the place. And it'll become more and more. Governments, for example, now assert that they own the children and have authority over them rather than the parents. God gave the authority and the responsibility to parents, not the state. In former days, another example, the government would never levy taxes against the church or any of its endeavors. Why? This was not because they were feeling generous. Governments and generosity are generally not found in the same sentence, particularly in the area of taxation. It was because a long, long time ago, which we're going to look at today, a long time ago it was established that God is over the governments of men, and therefore God was not a subject to their taxes. The earth belonged to God, not governments. So how could the government impose property taxes or exercise authority over God's kingdom was the basic theological, philosophical question. <coughs> it was based on the idea that God and his church are not taxable subjects. That's why there was no taxes. Every time by the way, that's probably changing. Um, the tax-exempt uh, status of churches, I think, will probably fall, I'm going to say, comfortably in the next five years, uh, particularly churches who do not affirm LGBTQ things and don't allow female elders and all those sorts of things. Um, they will be subject to taxes and, and probably a lot more. But anyway, every time there is an authority conflict anywhere, whether provincial versus federal or parents versus school board, at least one group or person is acting as a tyrant. They're taking authority that they do not properly have. The first item that we see in the statement by Jesus is, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and things to God the things that are God's. No human institution has unrestricted authority over everything. It has its role, it has its borders, but you are required to render to God the things that are God's and not get the two confused. As Roman 13 teaches us, all authority has been delegated to other authority structures by God on earth. And through that, don't just immediately register, oh, he's talking about civil government. He's talking about the rulers of the nation. No, all authority structures, all of the authority structures in a society have been ordained by God, and they need to be obeyed. For example, there's some madness going out there where it says, you know, submit to the elders, and then one of the passage, the verse goes on to say, everyone be submissive one to another. And so people are going, oh, so there's what it means is some days children submit to parents, and then I guess sometimes parents submit to kids. Parent, no. It means everybody in the world has somebody who's an authority over them, and all of you need to be submitting to the appropriate authority. And, and you do. You need to be submitting to the appropriate authority. But understand also, in a delegated authority, God does not give up any of his authority. He doesn't say, okay, I'm going to delegate the care and the protection of the wife to the husband. And then if the, wife, the husband begins to abuse his authority... And abuse the wife, God doesn't go, oh dear, look what I've done, and wring his hands. I wish, I wish I could intervene, but I, I delegated authority now. Now I've got nothing to say. How, how can I say anything? I mean, they're the ones with the authority now. No. 
That's nonsense. God delegates authority, but he's never not the authority ultimate. Right? Never. So, in delegating authority, God does not give up any of his functioning authority. The various bodies of authority that held are held responsible to their use of authority to accomplish the Lord's ends or they're governing without or outside the authority of God. And they're operating illegally in the biblical sense. I'm going to use what I hope is a humorous illustration. If half the congregation gets up and leaves mad, then I'll go, okay, probably won't use that illustration again. Uh, but we're going to try. Okay, let's give this a whirl. I am a pastor. That's not the funny, well, it is actually. If only you knew who I was really. Anyway, I'm a pastor. As an as, and, and that means I'm an elder in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as such, the scripture says, for good or ill, I'm to exercise oversight over the church. That's what I'm supposed to do. Better put, we as elders, collectively, are to, as a council or a college of equals, exercise oversight over the church. Where do I get that? First Peter chapter 5, 1 to 3, Hebrews chapter 13. That First Peter chapter 5, 1 to 3 talks about, here, preacher boy, here's what you do. Hebrews 13, verse 7 says, those of you who are in the congregation, here's what you do. Submit to those who have the rule over you. Okay, so it's made clear. Um, I didn't write that honest. It was in Scripture before I got here. Okay, I've been here a long time, but not that long. So, guys, what would you do? What would you do as honor-bound you need to do if Pastor Howard slips a cog. Some of you are suspicious already. That's happened. But anyway, what if it turns out Pastor Howard has slipped a cog and he comes onto your yard and he says, declares, you know something? The flower beds are all wrong and they need to be moved immediately I'll check back in a week. Those need to be over there. Um, what are you going to do? I'm a pastor. Do I have some authority? Do I have some sort of say in something? Well, I've taken authority over that, your flower beds. What are you going to do about it? You go, oh boy, I had, I had no idea, but I mean, Pastor Howard says, right? How about if Pastor Howard likes fuchsia? And you don't like fuchsia. Or how about if I come on your place and I say, actually, I don't like how you're organizing this. You need to park your cars this way from here on in. And I get out my little paint can and I make some marks on your yard. And I say, here's where you need to park your vehicles. No. Chop, 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 get to it. I'm a pastor. Don't you have to do what I say? Or, ladies, by the way, this will never happen. Anyway, I decide to rearrange your kitchen cupboards, ladies. Because where they are doesn't make any sense to me. I, I'm just going to organize them a little different. Okay? And I'm going to check to see where the cinnamon is from here on in. Or, if you're about to perform a Proverbs parental moment, I think you know what I'm talking about, and I say, no, 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 I didn't approve of that. You didn't ask my permission first. Well, now it's getting a little closer. Because there's churches out there that'll do that. There's churches out there that says, I'm the pastor. I'll tell you when you spank your kids. 
There's churches out there that say, actually, I'm an apostle. I'm a prophet. You do what I say or you will bring about the wrath of God on your neck. Or, I say, your discipline was too soft. And I say, I, I, I'm going to have to redo that. And I take your little sweethearts by the hand and I lead them off to discipline them properly. You going to go for that? Or what if I said, I sat you down, couple, and I said, look at the last two kids you had. Like, take a good look at those kids. Um, they are, let's just say it, they're perfect little monsters. And besides which, they're funny looking. And it's not really all that surprising, right? Um, so here on in, I declare your quiver is full. No more kids for you two. I'm the pastor. Seriously? Would you believe God is holding you to task to do what I say in those areas? And I would counter, but, but I'm a pastor and I took authority. There should be something ticking in your head that says, so what if you took authority? Did God ever grant you the authority to have say in that area? What does God expect you to do when pastors, that happens, or school boards, or medical boards, or counties, or whoever. What does he expect us to do when people step over the boundaries God has established? Well, again, I'm not going to get everything said. I'm admitting that. But I'm going to say a few things, and I hope they're helpful. Okay? Let's do a short course in Daniel. The only thing better one of the many things that would be better than that is to do a long course in Daniel, but let's go and do a short course for now. Okay. Daniel flying over <clears throat> at 50,000 feet at jet speed. Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1 is the personal testing of Daniel. Are you going to accommodate yourself to the situation you're in? Or are you going to trust God and obey him even though it could get you into trouble? That's the setup of Daniel chapter 1. You're probably familiar with that. Well, Daniel said, I'm going to trust God and I'm not going to eat unkosher food. Even though, that, that's an amazing thing. The kid would have been maybe 15, separated from his home. <coughs> Parents probably dead. Um... Tremendous coercion to adopt the culture, given the name of, of the nation he's in. What in the world is he going to do? Well, he's going to stay true to God. I, I take great comfort in that. Kids that the Lord has his hand on will stand in horrible circumstances by the Spirit of God. Okay? That doesn't mean, oh man, Daniel's parents did a great job. Who knows? But God did a great job with Daniel. Okay, let's put the proper, um, give, give proper recognition to who did what. Okay, so let's go to verse 19. The end of that, the king talked with them. That is Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. God talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found like, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. <coughs> Kid's a young teenager. 
And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. What a great statement at the end. Here he is at the very beginning stage of the Babylonian captivity. And it says here, and he continued until what? The first year of Cyrus the king. He outlived his captors. Daniel, by the grace of God, took his foot and kicked stones on the coffin of the empire that had taken him as captive. He lived long enough to see its demise 70 years later. That's what we're learning from that. All right. Daniel chapter 2, the public testing of Daniel. Now in the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled in his sleep, left him. Then the king gave orders to call all the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. The king said to them, I had a dream. My spirit is anxious to understand the dream. You're familiar with all of that. And uh, they said, you got to tell me what the dream is, because Nebuchadnezzar knew if he told them the dream, he would just kind of spin anything, right? Um, so he says, no, you got to tell me the dream, too, because he wanted to make sure that something supernatural was going on. They all just said, you can't do that. No, no one can do that. The only, only the gods can do that. And then Daniel says, put me in, coach. God will help me do that. And he did. He told them what the dream was and told them what the dream meant. And remember the statue. And basically, he's giving the world history that is some of it still yet future for us. The head was the head of gold, and that represented Babylon. Then after that, there was silver, the chest piece of silver. That represented a different empire that was to come after him. After that, there was bronze. And then after that, there was iron. And the iron came in two stages. The iron, of course, was Rome. First stage was the two legs, the uh, Roman Empire West and the Roman Empire East. The final phase of this is feet that are ten toes. It's going to be a ten-nation confederacy at the end. That's yet future for us. So he, he says, here's what's going on. He says, you are that head of gold, and after you shall come. And that would have been just totally politically incorrect. Because you always say to the king, O king, live forever. He says, you're not going to live forever. Um, your empire is going to come to an end. And that would have been super comfortable for Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel doesn't care. He's just going to tell it how it is. So anyway, let's scoot ahead to Daniel chapter 2, verse 46. <coughs> he says, in, let's go to 44. <coughs> in the days of those kings, the God, will, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will cut, crush and put... And then to all those kingdoms, but it itself will endure forever. Inasmuch as you saw that stone was cut out of mountain without hands, and it was crushed, the iron, the bronze, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king that what will take place in the future, so the dream is trustworthy, interpretation is trustworthy. There's going to come a day where the stone, the rock, in which, of course, we find out later on is Christ is going to come and he's going to smash with finality all world empires. Well, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, did homage to Daniel. Daniel wouldn't have liked that. What can he do? And gave orders to present to him an offering of fragrant incense. Again, couldn't do anything about that. The king answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods <coughs> and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mystery since you've been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king promoted Daniel, gave him many gifts, and he made him a ruler of the whole province of Babylon. That's pretty good, because he's now maybe in his late teens. That's pretty good. But watch this. And chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Chief prefect over all the wise men. That's interesting. Now they're not referred to as magicians and soothsayers, but wise men. And a Bible believer and a disciple of Yahweh is the head. There's lots of unbelievers, but 
now in this body of people who were basically international kingmakers, Daniel is set in the head of. Just so you know, this was the start of the Magi. The Magi that eventually, still operating hundreds of years later as international wise men and now international kingmakers, visited Herod, having seen a star Daniel would have told them to watch for. Thank you. You're a good guy. Okay, so he's the head. And now that whole, that whole thing of the international lawmaking body has a believer at its head. Okay, Daniel chapter 3. Public testing of Daniel's friends and fellow believers. Nebuchadnezzar <coughs> commands worship. Verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. The height of which was 60 cubits, and its width 60 cubits, and he set up on the plain of Dura, the province of Babylon. He set up the image, and true to the dream, he had the head of gold and the middle of silver. No. He said the whole thing is gold, which was basically, nah, Babylon's not going to fall. I'm going to be it. I'm going to be the one, and Babylon's never going to fall to another group of people. I'm the dude, and, and I'm going to celebrate that, and everyone's going to worship that, is what he's saying. So everybody's supposed to, to bow down, mentions all the people, all the various uh, power structures. And then he says all the kind of musical instruments are going to be used, and I don't know if that's ever going to catch on, because one of the things is a set of bagpipes. I don't know. Anybody here practicing bagpipes? Okay, you can leave. Anyway, they're, here they are. They're supposed to have this music. And when the music hits, they're all supposed to bow down. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, don't bow down. And he says, I don't think you're getting the message. When the music played, you're supposed to bow down. Um, now, if you're ready, the stuff is going to happen again, and you, we'll give you another chance. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace, a blazing fire, and what God is there that can deliver you out of my hands? Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. We don't have to say a thing. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire. God can if he wants to deliver us. Oh, and he will deliver us out of your hand. Either he'll deliver us from the fiery furnace, or we'll die. One way or the other, we're going to be delivered out of your hand. Right? That's, man, that's great theology. O oh, king. But if he does not, if he doesn't keep us alive... Let it be known to you, O king, that we're not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Well, question. Is Nebuchadnezzar in charge? Is he the government? Yep, he's the government. Um, does, is there any legislative body that can contradict him? Nope. Nope. But he's commanded something he doesn't have authority to require, even if he is the emperor. These young kids have got good theology. Now, I want to point something out, because some of you are going, yeah, but, and I, we don't want to talk about yeah, buts, you know, running through the bush. You're thinking, yeah, but he's being asked to do something sinful. Well, that is true. But the text does not argue that they were asked to do something sinful and therefore they didn't do it. That was true enough. But that was not what the passage reasons. What is reasoned is that he took authority that was not his and he did not recognize that he was under authority and the authority was delegated 
to be used as God requires. He'd become a tyrant. And so they said no. Verse 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished. Why are they astonished? Because they, they fell into the furnace, but he said to his officials, was it not three men you were cast into the midst of the fire? And they, they replied to the king, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of gods. Something supernatural looks about that guy. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire, and he responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the El Elyon. Doesn't know his name, but just says, the Most High God. That's that part is, you got that part, right? And come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire, and the satraps and all those guys gathered around, saw the regard, <coughs> in regard to these men, that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielding up their bodies so as not to serve or worship except their own God. They were observing proper authority. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensively against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb. He still has to get his He-Man thing in there. Be torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap. In his, and he would do that. Inasmuch as there is no God, other God, who is able to deliver in this way, then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. He'd become a tyrant, so they just said, actually, uh, we need to um, submit ourselves to the proper authority. We'll submit ourselves to God no matter where that takes us. Okay, chapter 4, the conversion of the emperor. As far as I know, this is the only passage that is written by a world emperor that is authored by somebody who is sitting at that moment as a world emperor of the world. This chapter was written by Nebuchadnezzar, um, probably a year before he died, and perhaps weeks after he came to his senses and God restored his marbles. Okay, so um, the, con the conversion of the emperor. You probably heard about the thing he's, he's got this this dream, there's a great big tree, and uh, he, he sees the tree and the all kinds of things nesting in the tree, and God says, I'm going to chop the tree down. He goes, whoa, whoa, what? No, I'm going to chop the tree down. And Nebuchadnezzar knew enough to think, because that was one of his symbols, um, I bet you that doesn't bode well for me, and he was right, it didn't. He says, God is saying, I'm going to chop you down for a season, and then you'll come back up again. But the whole point of the thing uh, we see is he's, um, where should we start here? Verse 17, for example, the sentence is by the decree of the angelic watchers. The decision is a command of the holy ones in order that the living may know, what? That the most high, the al el -Yon, is ruler over the realm of mankind, Selah. Think about that a minute. In every situation, in every government you can think of in the world, he is over them, whether they acknowledge it or not. And, yikes, he bestows it on whom he wishes and sets over it the lowly list of men. Why is that guy with the really bad haircut still the dictator in North Korea. Is it because of his incredible wit? Because of his incredible political savvy? It's because God, for his reasons, is keeping him there. 
And you go, but I don't understand. And I don't think I even really like that. We talked about that in Sunday school. Um, God is far more interested, committed to the idea that you understand he is the Almighty than you think, well, I got every God figured out and, and he, com- he, he complies perfectly with, with all of my particular sensibilities. If you adopt the view, like that is common, that there's bad things happening in the world and God is so heartbroken over them because he wishes he could do something, but he just realizes, I just, I can't do anything about it. If you're worshiping that kind of a God, God says directly, you're involved in idolatry. Even if you call that God, God. Even if you call that God Yahweh, I regard that, he says, as a species of idolatry. You're worshiping another God because I've said very clearly in my word, this is who I am, not who you think I should be. Eh? All right. Well, that was the thing he was supposed to realize. Let's go on. Verse 28. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace of Babylon. The king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the Great, which I myself was built as a royal residence by the might of my power for the glory of my majesty? He just, he, he's just having a me moment. Of all the people that I admire, I admire me the most. Nebuchadnezzar is saying. While the word was in the king's mouth. A voice came from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared, sovereignty has been renewed from you, and you'll be driven away from mankind, and your dwelling place will be with the beasts of the field. You will be given grass to eat like cattle, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize, by the way, seven periods of time, that's a great key, because that periods of time is used a little bit later, and it refers to a year. And so Daniel's 70 weeks, heptads, they're all years. Anyway, that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and he bestows it on whom he wishes. How is it we still don't have that straight? How is it that we still don't quite have that theology together? Immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from mankind, began eating grass, Like cattle, his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nail like bird's claws. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven. My reason returned to me. Why? Because God said it was going to be this long and no longer. God gave him his marbles back one last time. Interesting. If you study the documents that come out of this period of time, they're all signed. And for seven years, wow, is Babylon being administrated in a cracking good way. Efficient, honest, no bribery. Like it was just for seven years it just it was Babylon's best years. Why? Because they said all the documents are being signed by some Hebrew slave who seems to be running the whole thing. We even have that in our secular documents. Not that that's the reason you, that you would believe it. The Bible says it. That's good enough. But just so that you know. Anyway, he says, My reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, <clears throat> and praised and honor him who lives forever. And here's what he got. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. He's the one that actually rules... And his rule is never interrupted. His rule is never interrupted. Well, you go, but yeah, but today there are some, you wouldn't believe it, but there's some knotheads out there. Yeah, I know. But his dominion is never interrupted. Sometimes God brings the penalty of the judgment of abandonment on a nation when they have continually and continually and continually done what is wrong. And he allows them to be administrated by fools, 
madmen, and children. Anyway, his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. It doesn't get interrupted. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does. He accomplishes according to his will in the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. That is said in a particularly unrestricted way. It's not except for, oh, but in the exception of. And no one can ward off his hand. Contrast that with the, oh, God saw the tornado barreling down in that poor little town. He goes, I just, I just wish I could do something about it. Oh, please abandon such a horrible, blasphemous, idolatrous religion. No one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? No one can say, I, I don't think you should have done that, God. You don't have the intellectual firepower to review what God's doing. At that time my reason returned to me and my majesty and my splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom and my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out so that I was reestablished and my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. How come... How come Daniel didn't say, actually, this is working pretty good. The other guy's a tyrant, and he's a madman anyway. He's out kind of in the back there eating grass like an ox. How about somebody just kind of go over there with a brick bat and say, hey, Mr. Moo Cow, look up for a minute. Bonk! Many people would say, well, did the world a lot of good. Why would he, at the end of that, hand everything back, hand everything back to Nebuchadnezzar because Daniel wasn't a tyrant. He didn't take authority that wasn't his. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and honor, exalt and honor the king of heaven for all his works are true and his ways are just and he's able to humble those who walk in pride. Wow. The emperor of the then known world had light downloaded into him and he wrote a chapter of scripture. Um, this is where Daniel veers off and he begins to write in Chaldean, not Hebrew, because the whole world Chaldean, need to hear it in their language, Chaldean, not Hebrew. All right, verse five, the position of Daniel 60 years later We'll just scoot ahead to chapter <coughs> 10. The queen entered the banquet hall. There's writing on the wall. They're all upset. Queen entered the banquet hall because of his words of the king and his nobles. The queen spoke and said, O king, love forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There's a man in whom your, your kingdom, in your kingdom, in whom is a spirit of the holy gods and in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, actually his grandfather, but the term in the Hebrew allows for both. Their father, the king, appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge, and insight, interpreting of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficulty problems were found in this Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar, let Daniel now be summoned and he will declare the interpretations. This is the end of the Babylonian days. This is about year 70. In fact, it's exactly year 70 of the fall of Jerusalem. He would have been 12 or 13. He is now 83 or 84 years old. And he has been for the last... 60 years, the guy who's been running the wise men. And he hasn't been slack. He has been providing, he has been setting in course a whole government philosophy. And the government philosophy that we're going to see here very soon is, and every ruler is 
under a constitution, and the constitution says God is king. You're not. All right. Daniel chapter 6. I told you we're having to fly over this. I want to just teach you the whole thing, but you guys didn't bring lunches today. Chapter 6. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom, and over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. This then Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps because he possessed an extraordinary spirit, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. He would be second command of the entire world yet again. Well, they don't like that. And so they say, is there some way that we can get rid of him? And they say, yeah, we can get rid of him if it has something to do with him obeying God rather than men. And so they set up a deal. Then the commissioners, were six, and satraps came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows, King Darius, live forever. All the commissioners of the kingdom, that's a lie, Daniel's not part of that. All the commissions of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the high officials and the government are consulted together that the king should establish a statute and force an injunction that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Why would you do that? Well, first of all, they say several times here that there would be an injunction. An injunction. Okay? It's a particular word in the Hebrew. It... Um, is a word that, that means it is a temporary <coughs> enabling to do something illegal. It's admittedly illegal. It wouldn't pass the test of the Constitution, but we're going to do it temporarily. The reason would be uh, what we're going to do is we're going to sniff out all the people who are disloyal to the new kingdom, and we'll be able to dispatch of them so we carry on the kingdom is secured. But it's, it's going to be an injunction. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may be ch- so that not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may uh, not be revoked. In other words, when you sign this into law, you can't change it. There's something above you. What we have here is a constitutional monarchy established. Who came up with that idea? Daniel. It is now the new law of the Medes and the Persians, because the law of the Medes and the Persians has been run by a believer for the last 70 years. Therefore, King Darius signed the document, the Esaur, that is the injunction. By the way, if you're looking for the... Um, there's a, a term that is used today that would be the equivalent, and that is mandate. When governments start talking about a mandate, it means that they are admitting what they're doing is illegal according to the Constitution, but for reasons X, Y, and Z, we're going to do it anyway temporarily. Okay? But even though we think it's not legal. All right. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house, Now in his roof chamber he had windows open toward Jerusalem. He continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God. He did a few things that um, were a little obvious. Number one, he adopted the position of prayer. You wouldn't need to do that. He could have just sat there in his chair with his eyes closed in a coffee cup. And nobody would be the wiser. But he does something very deliberately. He takes the, the, the posture of prayer. And at the end of it, the guys say, he was praying to God. How would they know? He was praying out loud. He was expecting to be overheard. Wow. Then these men came by agreement, found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. He made that obvious in his prayer. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Did you not sign an injunction? Any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den. The king replied, that statement is true. According to the laws of the Mesian Persians, which may not be revoked, it's 
above me my, now. I can't change it, even though he's an emperor. <coughs> then they answered and spoke before the king. Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petitions three times a day. I think we found the one who's the bad guys here that we need to get rid of, public enemy. Then as soon as the king heard the statement, he was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Then these main men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Recognize, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute with the king established may be changed. Daniel had done something else with the legal system because the Bible says justice that is delayed is injustice. And he'd made a rule now, if it is found to be just, do it today. That's a, that's a good basic system. I wish we could get back to that. Anyway, then the king gave orders to Daniel, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den, which means he'd have had probably <clears throat> a 25-foot vertical drop into a cave. He's, what, 83, 84 years old? Um, I'm 60. Okay, so my body geometry is a little different. I haven't been eating vegetarian. But a, a drop like that, I, I would be thinking, okay, lion, just finish me off. I'm done. Anyway, they threw him in. Your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. A stone was brought, laid over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring with the signet rings of the nobles so that nothing could be changed in regard to Daniel. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting and no entertainment was brought before him and his sleep fled from him. The emperor is wringing his hands saying, I can't do anything. Not God. Then the king arose at dawn at the break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. Well, not into, went to the lion's den. When he come near to the den of Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. Ah, troubled voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? He said with a trembling voice, probably expecting to hear nothing but a satisfied burp from a lion. Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever, which is this, uh, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Not, not sweating, not, I'm getting tired running away from these critters, they run fast. O king, live forever, hi. My God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me as much as, and as much as I was found innocent before him. Here's our first little piece. Why does the emperor have to do what the law says? He's the law. He's the emperor. No. Because of Daniel, there's a constitutional law that is above him that he must obey. Daniel prayed publicly, out loud, and visibly. Was it a direct disobedience to his law to pray? Yes. Why did he do that? Why did he pray out loud publicly? Why? Well, let's do a little history dive. Historically, there have been three approaches to the question I asked at the beginning of the study. What do we do? One is, and I'm not making up these labels, these are historic labels, okay? One is called the Catholic approach. Do whatever the king says, period. Do whatever the king says. The Pope will intervene and threaten with excommunication and get him back into line, and if he doesn't, flee and get to a Catholic state. Catholic approach. Second one is called, depending on where you are in the world, either the Lutheran approach or the Anglican approach. All right, why? Well, in Germany, uh, historically, that's changing, but the government retained the right to hire the local priest 
and the pastor was approximately an employee of the state. So they didn't feel quite the need to be putting money in the offering plate because the state paid his wages. Um, the government paid his salary and hired him and assigned him. You'll be preaching here, you'll be preaching there, okay? And I know that's changed a little, but that was the rough idea over the last few years. In England, the head of the church was whatever monarch, the queen or the king. For the last few decades, the head of the church has been Queen Elizabeth II, right? So the rule was in those areas with people like that, or under that sphere, do whatever the government says unless it requires you to directly sin. And for many of you, if I were to ask what are you supposed to do in these situations, you would have said that. But you wouldn't have realized, oh, that's called the Lutheran approach, or that's called the Anglican approach. You maybe didn't hear about the third option, which is called the Puritan approach. And if you know me very well by now, you're going, I'll bet you Howard is more of the Puritan approach. Yeah, guilty as, guilty as charged. The third position is the Puritan position, and that position drew heavily on, wait for it, the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel. Throughout history, different empires have wobbled from being full republics where the Senate and the Constitution were in charge, <coughs> or the emperor or the king was in charge, and he ignored the Constitution like there was no authority over him. Different countries wobbled both ways. Guys, it is impossible to understand Roman history without understanding that going on all the time. Remember Julius Caesar? They're deciding whether they're going to they're kill Julius Caesar or not, and everybody, the knives are out, and they go after him. A tu Brute, uh, you too, Brutus. And they're killing him so that the Senate can be back in charge, not... Julius Caesar as God. So that, that nation is going back and forth from, are we under a constitution where the emperor says, you know, I, I'm not the ultimate authority to, yeah, you have to worship me, I am a God. That, Rome is flashing back and forth from that to, impossible to understand Roman history without seeing that seesaw battle. You need to understand that was going on when the Magi rode into Herod's court they were constitutionalists. And here they were driving into Herod's front yard, who were the current, the current government was the emperor is God. And we immediately go, oh, this could be a conflict. Yeah, that's why it wasn't three wise men showing up and three dopey camels. They never traveled anywhere without a crack group of troops of about 250 men armed to the teeth. That's what would have come to Herod's front door. Anyway, different emperors ex exercised power differently on this point. You remember probably the ancient Roman statement by Trajan. Trajan held his sword up in the air and he said, for me, the power of the sword. And then he said, if I deserve it, in me. Oh, He's going to be a constitutionalist. Okay, that's what's being said. That was a constitutional primacy point. Others acknowledged no higher authority and desired to be worshipped as God. No constitutional oversight. Flops back and forth. English, French, and European kings likewise seesawed back and forth on this issue. Were they going to be subject to God or a God or a constitution? like Daniel had begun? Think back a little bit about, oh, a thousand years. The Magna Carta, or the Great Charter, was an attempt by the Archbishop of Canterbury, no less, Stephen Langdon, to reestablish the law of the Medes and the Persians, Daniel, that the emperor, the king, was not the highest authority in the country. 
And so they forced the king to sign the Magna Carta. Okay, you are answerable to somebody. The Church of God was the highest authority, they said, and there was no constitution that declared the rights that God granted, um, and there was now going to be a constitution that declared rights that God granted to parents, to pastors, to employers, to husbands, to worshipers, that the government could never take away from. That was part of the Magna Carta. The Westminster Confession applies itself to this in great detail. Flops back and forth in human history. Henry VIII said, boy, this is a problem. So he solved the problem of the conflict, he thought, by making himself the new pope of the English church, hence the Anglican church. Well, the Puritans, when they were drafting the American Constitution, that's who was drafting the American Constitution, went back past the Magna Carta to the councils of Daniel. You see it in their writing. Daniel told them who was the true authority, and that's why the American Constitution says God was the true authority. And if he bestowed an authority in this area to the parents or that area to this group, that was what the truth of the matter was because all authority is conferred by God. We talk about the American Constitution being the separation of church and state. What that really meant is the state doesn't have ultimate authority. There are other authorities in the culture. For example, the authority over children is parents, not the school board. The authority over an employer, employee is the employer, supposed to be, okay? There's all those sorts of things are established by God. If one takes authority not conferred to him by God, he's a tyrant. In Canada, when I went to school, Pluto was still regarded as one of the planets. I'm that old. But in addition to that, in Canada, we were under something called the British North America Act. Okay? The BNA Act. That was our original constitution. And it was drafted by Puritans. Puritans. Um, and that went all the way back past the Magna Carta to Daniel. Our present Bill of Rights, which a fellow by the name of Trudeau, a little earlier Trudeau than our present, was quick to try and get rid of the BNA Act and do something called the Canadian Bill of Rights, which watered down the writing significantly. But still, in the Canadian Bill of Rights, it's greatly watered down, but still says people have rights given by God, not by government. Now, those rights cannot be taken by government. They are supposed to be defended by government. That's why up until today, the church does not pay taxes, for example. As I said, God is not a taxable subject, and that, of course, will probably change. Anyway, he says, um, they were out of order. Uh, you, sir, Darius, Daniel says, you were out of order. Uh, so he says, verse 22 of Daniel chapter 6, they've not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. I disobeyed, and I was innocent. I didn't break any laws. Oh, he says something more. This is interesting. And also toward you, O king, I have committed no, no crime. Oh, he says the two, I mean, this guy is bright. He ran the whole world really, uh, so he's not, you know, some dim bulb. He says two separate things. I didn't commit a crime before God, and I didn't actually break your law. You go, wait a minute, Daniel. Yes, you did. Because the emperor clearly said, you're not supposed to pray. And I prayed anyway, and he says, no, I didn't commit a crime. What do you, what do you mean by that? He was innocent before him. Daniel broke the tyrant's laws without breaking the law of God. Interesting, he, 
He's still in subjection to the emperor. He says, O king, live forever. Hi, how are you doing? Respectful. He actually submitted himself to the penalty of standing up for truth. That's part of what good believers do. If you're going to disobey, you take the consequences. But anyway, he says, Toward you, king, I've, I've committed no crime. Um, here's the deal. If, if the law is an illegal law according to their constitution, it isn't a real law. It isn't a real law. So Daniel broke the tyrant's law without breaking the law of God. Let's be serious here. To not pray was not a sin, as recorded in the law of Moses. He didn't say, no, I have to pray because the law of Moses says I need to pray three times. Where does it say that? It doesn't. He could have complied with the law without sinning. That wasn't the point. One was not required in addition to pray publicly or out loud. Daniel was making a point to his fellow countrymen. You can still pray. God says. God gives you the right to pray and to worship God and gather and to do so and a government is not authorized by God to take that away. He was also making a point to his unbelieving host government officials and to the emperor. God gives a person, even a slave, who Daniel was, a slave and a foreigner, who Daniel was, he gives them the right to pray and worship God and gather to do so and a government is not authorized to take that away not in Babylon not in Pyongyang not in Beijing not in Ottawa not in Riyadh or not even in London you know London has been one of the bigger um, groups that have broken this all the way back there was something called the Great Eviction, where the government came along and said, okay, we're going to change things, and here are the prayers you're allowed to pray, and here are the hymns you're allowed to sing, and here's what you're allowed to say during church time. And there's a whole bunch of people who said, no. And they weren't saying, no, because if we, if we pray that, if we say that, it's sin. They're saying, no, you don't have the authority to say that. That's the point. And they got all kicked out. And so they were doing church in places like the Cripple Gate and, and in places where uh, they weren't being watched and so forth. And it's going on today. There are people all the time now, I know two uh, recently, who are in London. And they're standing within the so-called ring around an abortion clinic and they're just quietly standing there to themselves praying and the police arrest them because they think, I think you're praying to God and that's disrupting. You can't do that. We say so. There's a whole bunch of people are going, no, you can't do that. And Britain is going to decide if they're going to be constitutional or if they're going to be going back to, it seems like the whole world is going to take its run at, at um, totalitarian Marxism. But anyway, London has been bad for this and continues to be. But government does not give people rights. God has given people rights and governments are to protect them with a biblically just legal system. If we had a biblically just legal system, it would be quick and there would be capital punishment, for example. Um, it's supposed to provide a national defense system, that's part of bearing the sword, defend the borders, and you're supposed to be protecting rights. And when government grants some people legitimate authority, like school officials, medical officials, soldiers, or police, they must conform to his standards or they have gone beyond his boundaries. And so he says to the king, I didn't commit any crime. It was an illegal law even by their law as well. If the realities of all nations under God is going to be lived out, 
Daniel, of all men, needed to live it. And he did. And he did. All right. Man, we're running short in time. How are we to respond to tyranny that impedes our God-given responsibilities to render to God the things that are God's? I'm going to give you three things here, really quick. Is it complete? No, but some things. Sometimes hide, sometimes run, sometimes stand. There. The Israelites hid the baby boys from the government officials and the crocodiles. Good for them. Joash's aunt, Jehoshiba, hid the little prince in the temple so the wicked tyrant queen Athali couldn't wipe out the messianic line. Good for her and the priests. Elijah hid in the wilderness and ate what the ravens stole. Good for Elijah. In North Korea, the church meets secretly and hides in tall grass and ditches to get together. Good for them. Sometimes you should run away. Matthew chapter 10 basically says if you're in one place and they're persecuting you, walk away. Go to the next city. That's Matthew 10. Matthew 24, he says things that are going to happen in the future. In the dark days that are yet to come, if you're Jewish and you hear this leader of the European Union has signed a seven-year peace treaty, beware. When he breaks the treaty halfway through, run and hide. Get out of there. Don't go back for your coat. They had a legal arrest warrant for Paul. Paul was a lawyer. He knew what that meant. Damascus has an arrest warrant. And so with the help of some buddies, he escaped over the wall of the bas- in a basket, and then he ran. Good for Paul. Good for Paul. And sometimes you stand. They did in Acts chapter 4. We're going to stand and preach. You know, they could have stood and preached two miles out of town. That's okay. But they decided to preach where? In the temple. In the temple. Why? Because God said they could. God said they could. And so, Acts chapter 5, they did it again. He says, we're going to obey God rather than men. In other words, it's an issue of who's got the authority, and you don't. And they took their beating. And they took their beating. Paul frequently took his beating, lots of times. But sometimes he pulled a Daniel, like Daniel did, where push open the doors, let everyone see what I'm doing, to give a little bit of room to the other believers and a bit of a pushback to the tyrants, He says, for example, when he's been taken and put in prison, and uh, he says, by the way, is it okay for you to put me in stocks and beat me and I haven't had a trial and I'm a Roman citizen? They go, oh, oops, did that one wrong. And so they said, okay, well, then you just get out of here. And he goes, no, no, I don't think so. You come down here and you let me free yourself. And they go, okay, yeah, we get it. And they came there and they're hat in their hands and they're going, okay, we, we'll let you go. Sorry about that. Would you please leave? What that did was it gave a little bit of courage to the believers around. Do you know something? You've got a little more protection than you think from the tyrants. And it gave the tyrants a little bit of a, hey, careful, you've got a law over you. That was a good thing to be done by Paul. Chapter 22, they're pulling him out of the crowd. There's a riot, and the Roman official said, okay, I don't know what to do with it. Obviously, they hate this guy. Beat him, and find out what he did. And Paul says, so, is that legal? To imprison me and give me a beating? And I'm a Roman citizen, I've never had a trial. And he goes, oh, ha. Sorry about that. Here, let me put a little bit of a rub on here. Bracelets there. He kind of did a little bit of pushback because the tyrant needed to know that he shouldn't be doing that. Actually, that was a petty tyrant. Rome didn't have the authority of that, and he was 
supporting the authority of Rome, so he had become a petty tyrant. Paul was pushing back on that. So sometimes you hide, sometimes you run, sometimes you stand. Lord, give you wisdom to know how to do that. I'll give you a few cautions. Be careful, be prudent, be thoughtful with your liberty. You may have to take a beating for it. Be prepared for that. You may be the cause of many getting beaten. Think about that. Tyrants have swords. Think it through. Is the issue big enough to warrant a fight? Your good may be evil spoken of. Yeah, well, that's true, and then it will be every time you open up your mouth and preach the gospel. That's going to happen. That's always going to be the case when you communicate the truth of God to a world of rebels, but is the issue worth the tumult or the consequences? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. For example, as an animal owner, under God, you can own an animal. And, you know, that's being sought to throw that away. But you can own an animal, you can keep it alive, or you can kill it and eat it, if you like. Those are the real rules. You can kill and eat it. Again, that's God's rule. But if you keep your pig in Riyadh, or if you kill it and eat your pig in Riyadh, your ministry and your ability to testify is over. Don't trade your ability to witness for Christ for a pork chop, even if it's your right. You can kill and eat a steer. You can do that. But if you do that in India, your ministry is over. Don't trade a lesser for a greater. Also, you might see other people doing this or doing that because they say, actually, I'm free to do that, but your conscience bothers you. Your conscience may be triggered by it where someone else's is not. Think it through if you're going to be a Puritan. Never violate your conscience. Well, so much more could be said. We do need to think through what we're going to do when the state tells us that we cannot talk to our children about gender issues. The world is telling our children that the parents do not have the right to restrict, to forbid, to discipline. But kids, listen up. They do so. Parents do have the right, even though the rest of the world is saying that they don't. Your kids, your, your parents have the right to discipline you. They have the responsibility to. Culture's wrong. Our state has told us and our children that we have the right to kill babies and inconvenient old people. But God has never bestowed that right or that authority. They're being tyrants of death. Don't get confused. Now well, we've got to land this plane. But for now, render, pay back what you owe to God. What is the due of God? Deuteronomy chapter 10, he says, it's actually pretty simple. Here's what you need to do. Do everything he says you need to do. Refrain from doing everything he says don't do. And follow the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and your mind. See, it's pretty simple. Anyone got that done last week? God has the right and the authority to command your obedience. That's who this God is, right? Is your life stained with rebellion, rebellion to the law of God, and rebellion to the authorities God has allowed functioning in their proper role? Is that who you are? Does that what the world knows you as? Is your life corrupted and polluted with self-will? God has the right to expect your undivided loyalty and worship. Do the angels who daily observe your movements and hear your words know that of you? Is there an area of disobedience that the Holy Spirit is reminding of you at this very moment? What are you going to do about it? What you need to do is render to God the things that are God's. Render as due to God the things you owe him. Everything. Well, Luke 20, verse 26, 
and they were unable to catch him in a saying in the presence of the people. And being amazed at his answer, they became silent. I find our concluding verse a wonderful comfort. The evident supernatural competence of our Lord. The Lord never trips on his tongue. He never writes something in his word, sort of okay, but it could have been tweaked. He doesn't trip over his tongue. And he's wiser than the crafty. Isn't that good news? Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage. Help us to think these things through carefully and that at the end of it would, we would be people who are holy and that the world would see, oh, these are people who are followers of the Most High God. For your glory and our joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.